You're listening to The Jacob Vaught Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Vaught. Here he is. Jacob Vaught. Hello, sports fans. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk, and I've got an interesting show for you today. A couple of big college basketball games happened yesterday. Um, I also want to talk about a trending topic on Twitter and a sports death that has kind of flown under the radar. Not really, but it's worth bringing up. I also may debut some semi-recurring segments, depending on how long the other stories take. But I will start with OSU versus Maryland. And boy, oh boy, did I hit this game on the head. I mean, really, I called this game from the outset. I knew that Maryland would win. I knew that Caleb Wesson would be really the focal point of the Buckeyes' offense. And he was. He was their high man. Nearly had a double-double. 15 points, 9 rebounds. He played really well. There's no question about that. The thing that I liked about this game for the Buckeyes was that They did get a couple other players involved. They got Caleb's brother Andre involved. And they got um, DJ Carton involved also. They both had 14 points. They both played really well. Shot the ball well. But ultimately, Maryland was just too balanced for them. Maryland has a bunch of ways that they can attack you. And it started yesterday with Anthony Cowan, who had a really, really good game. He was the high man with 20 points. 10 for 12 from the free throw line. I mean, you can't do much better than that. He was by far and away the best player for the Terrapins. Elsewhere, Jalen Smith, Daryl Morsell, and Eric Ayala... Combined for 30 points. Ayala did not have a good game shooting the ball. I thought that was going to hurt Maryland a lot as the game unfolded. But the Buckeyes were just never able to get anything going offensively on a continuous basis. It was always get the ball to Wesson. Get the ball to the other Wesson. And they really used Carton as a tertiary option. The thing that I like about Maryland is that they're so balanced. That's what killed the Buckeyes yesterday. Maryland's balanced attack. They didn't force the ball to Cowan. They let Smith get involved. They let Morsell get involved. They let Ayala get involved a lot, even when it was clear he didn't have it. That's what won Maryland the game yesterday. Their balanced scoring. I do want to talk about another element to that game, though. OSU's really, really sloppy play. I mean, say what you want about Caleb Wesson, and I think Wesson's a very good player, but he's very careless with the ball sometimes. And that means turning the ball over and taking bad shots. OSU shot a miserable 31% from the field in this game and only 18% from beyond the arc. Now, Maryland played well defensively, but it's not like they're world beaters out there defensively. It was a combination of their good, not great defense and OSU just not being a great team. I think OSU is being massively overrated this year. When they go up against balanced teams... They're going to struggle. A team that's sound offensively and sound defensively. This was a bad game for the Buckeyes. 
It's a scary game for them if you're a fan. It showed why they can be beat in March. You just have to hope that they can clean it up in two months. Moving over now to Baylor, Texas Tech. Now, I was right about OSU Maryland. I was wrong about this game. There's no question about that. Texas Tech came close to winning. They played Baylor tough. There's no question about that. Jameis Ramsey looked really, really good. 50% from beyond the arc, 7 for 17 from the field. And Kyler Edwards had a decent game. Scored 10 points. Wasn't terrible with shooting. The thing that killed them was a couple things. Number one was that they couldn't get Moretti and Shannon involved. Moretti, in 37 minutes, only scored 8 points. Shot 0 for 6 from beyond the arc. And Terrence Shannon, in 29 minutes, only scored 4 points. You can't win like that. You cannot win when you have two of your best players combining for only five field goals made. It was an atrocious game for them. But even with that, they still had a chance to win. But what really killed Texas Tech, and this surprised me a lot, because Baylor is not known for this, was their rebounding. Baylor out-rebounded Texas Tech in this game 44-25. to When you narrow it down to just offensive rebounds, Baylor won 17-10. Freddie Gillespie looked like Reggie Evans out there. He had a fantastic game, I thought. Was doing all the little things. It may not show up in the box score that much, but you know what? He looked great out there. He really did. There's a role for that in the NBA. Mark Vidal looked like Russell Westbrook out there. As a guard, 13 rebounds. That's Westbrook stuff. And Devontae Bandu, a guy who was off my radar, I'll be honest, I never heard of him. Seven rebounds off the bench? As a guard? He's a guard! He's only 6'3", 185. If Baylor can rebound like that in March, they are going to be a very tough team to beat. Because there's no Zion Williamson anymore. There's no Jackson Hayes. There's no Bull Bull. There's no guy who's going to come in and rebound the ball like crazy. If Baylor can rebound like that and do the fundamentals the way that they did against Texas Tech, they're going to be a very tough team to beat. I thought this was an incredibly impressive win. I do want to move over to the Twitter world now, and I was thinking of making this Twitter time, but I decided against it. Twitter time is more for people to interact with me directly. This was a topic that was trending at one point, and while it's not trending anymore, there's still a bunch of people tweeting about it. And that is that Eric Bieniemy, an African American, has not gotten a head coaching job. There are a lot of people crying racist about this. There are a lot of people saying that the Rooney Rule is a sham. The NFL still is no place for minorities. And I even saw one person say that this is going to cause a lot of African Americans to take college jobs. Now look, by all accounts, the enemy is ready for a head coaching job. He certainly fits the mold of what the NFL is looking for. The next Sean McVay, the next offensive Wunderkind, Andy Reid speaks very highly of him. And I'll tell you, he was my number one choice for the Jets job. When they hired Gase, 
My number one guy was Enemy. My order top five was Enemy, Matt LaFleur, Chris Peterson, David Shaw, and Adam Gase. I like Enemy a lot. And I can't give you a concrete answer as to why he has not gotten a head coaching opportunity. Now, granted, there's still the Browns job, but I don't think he's a serious candidate there. I know he was interviewed, but that may have just been a Rooney Rule interview. To me, that's a big culprit here, the Rooney Rule. The Rooney Rule is a good idea, but it's not working. A lot of people are interviewing African Americans deserving candidates for the job. Guys like Biennemi, uh Chris Richard, Perry Fuel. They're smart guys, but they're interviewing them just to check a box. They're not giving them a real opportunity. The interview is more them just nodding their head. They're not actually listening. And needless to say, that's 100% wrong. When you go into an interview, the least the employer can do is give you the time of day and give you a reasonable shot at getting the job. Even if you don't get the job, you can at least go to sleep knowing that you gave it your all, you were considered, and you did your best. But I gotta tell you, there are a lot of teams out there that are just not giving these guys the time of day. And it's not because they're racist. That's an argument I've seen from Jamel Hill, who I think is an idiot. I despise Jamel Hill with a burning passion. This is what she said. Kevin Nagandi tweeted, when it comes to qualifications and experience, what else does Eric Bieniemy have to do to get an NFL head coaching gig? And Hill responded, be the one thing he can't, which is white. Do you really think that Eric Bieniemy is not getting a head coaching job because he's an African American? Then why did Ron Rivera get hired? He's Mexican. Why did Todd Bowles get hired? He's African American. Lovey Smith, Tony Dungy, Art Shell. Do I really need to keep going? It's not because he's African American that he's not getting head coaching jobs. And the fact that you can't see that, Jamel, is really sickening. Look, I will grant you that these teams are not giving guys like Biennemi and Richard a legitimate chance. They are using them to satisfy the Rooney Rule, and that's all they are to these teams. They're check marks. But that doesn't make those teams racist. It means that we need to change the Rooney rule. I don't know what the solution is, but I can tell you it's not calling 32 owners racist. It's not for calling 32 GMs racist. Maybe the enemy just isn't a good interview. We haven't heard how he is interviewing. I have never seen a report saying that he aced an interview. There are a lot of ways that you can mess it up. Charlie Casserly told a story about how he took a guy off his list of head coaching candidates because he didn't like the third choice for his defensive coordinator. I don't know why Eric Bieniemy has not gotten a head coaching job. But it is not because these teams are racist. And for anyone to accuse them of that, lessons the real instances of racism that we have in this incredibly divided country. You're a part of the problem by doing that, not the solution. I do want to talk about the passing of George Pearls. And 
This was a guy who had been sick for a while and passed away today at the age of 85. He was an extremely loyal man. He played for Michigan State, then served in the Army for a couple of years, and then went back to Michigan State as their defensive line coach and was there for 11 years. While he was there, he learned from a legend, Duffy Dougherty, Hall of Famer, best coach in MSU history. After MSU, Pearls took the lessons that he learned from Dougherty to the Steelers, where he was an integral part in the Steel Curtain's dominance. That stunt 4-3 that Joe Green and Jack Lambert used to perfection, that was Pearls' idea. Then he went back to MSU and became head coach. And he is the third best head coach in MSU history. It's Dougherty, Mark D'Antonio, and Pearls. He won two conference titles, won a Rose Bowl, and if not for the academic scandal in 94, he would have a much better looking record. But he was cleared of all wrongdoing. I want to make that clear. Yet somehow, his record was negatively affected by it. I don't know how that makes sense. Look, I understand he's the head coach. But if he was cleared of wrongdoing, why is his record negatively affected? I just don't like that. He's a very underrated football coach. Has four Super Bowls. And will be deeply, deeply missed. I think I am going to debut one of those semi-recurring topics today. Maybe the other one, depending on how long this takes. I don't know. I want to leave it fluid. But here's the first ever edition of This Day in Sports History. On this day in 2012, Tim Tebow and the Denver Broncos upset the Pittsburgh Steelers in a wild card game in Pittsburgh. I mean, we all know that Tebow pulled out a bunch of miracles, had a bunch of game winning drives, a bunch of fourth quarter comebacks. When he took over for Kyle Orton, No one gave the Broncos a shot at the playoffs, but Tebow gave him a shot in the arm, and he led him to the playoffs. No one gave the Broncos a chance in this game. And in the first quarter, the Broncos looked lifeless. They could get nothing going, but then in the second quarter, something kicked in, and the Broncos ended up with a 20-6 lead going into the half. After that, the Steelers woke up. The Broncos only mustered a field goal in the second half, and the Steelers ended up tying the game late on a really good pass from Roethlisberger to the former Jet, Jericho Cotri. And then overtime hit. Broncos won the toss, and on the first play from scrimmage, Tim Tebow connects with Demarius Thomas in stride. And Thomas is able to outrun all the Steelers on his way to the end zone in one of the most improbable wins in recent NFL history. Tim Tebow in that game against Dick LeBeau's defense while he completed less Then 50% of his passes, he threw for 316 yards on 10 completions. He was responsible for three touchdowns. And this is a guy that no one gave 
any credit to. When he was picked by Josh McDaniels, it was laughed at. When he took over for Kyle Orton, no one gave him a shot. Even in the playoff game, no one gave him a shot. Going into the half, no one gave him a shot. Everyone thought the Steelers were going to storm back and win. But Tebow proved all the doubters wrong. And beat a very, very good Steelers defense. Led by Dick LeBeau. After that, we all know what happened, though. He got steamrolled by a much, much, much better Patriots team. Tebow was then traded to the Jets after the Broncos signed Peyton Manning. I I, <laughs> I could go into a whole rant on Tim Tebow with the Jets, but that's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is to celebrate what happened eight years ago today. Tim Tebow's improbable playoff win over the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think I'm going to leave it there. I won't debut the next semi-recurring segment yet. Maybe I'll debut it tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to talk about then. I'm sure something will break. Should be fun. I don't know what I have in store for you tomorrow, but I promise you, you're going to enjoy it. Until then, I am Jacob Volk saying that I'll sign anything but veal cutlets. My ballpoint pen slips on veal cutlets.